Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Math Law Talk season two, uh, season four. We are very lucky to have Dr. Uh, Nicole Black today. I'm Hao Chen Kuang, uh, a postdoc work, working at Leibniz Institute for new, new Materials in Germany. I will co-host today's talk with our uh, Math Lab uh, Society member, Yiran Yang. Uh, hi, Yiran. Uh, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Yiran Yang. I'm a PhD candidate at Caltech, and it's my great honor to be in this event, um, and I'm, I'm really happy to um, be here. All right. Thanks, Yiran. Uh, so uh, before we start, we want to thank uh, Jian Ying, uh, Xiao Shang, uh, Bing Bing, and uh, Chen for their effort to organize this event. Our talk will uh, our talk will take about like one hour. I will first briefly introduce our society, and then Iran will introduce our doctor, uh, our guest speaker, Doctor uh, Nicole Black. And the presentation will take about roughly forty five uh, minutes, and uh, we have fifteen minutes for questions from our audience. You can write your question in the chat board or just raise your hands and we will promote you to the panel uh, to discuss with our speaker. So the Metal Society is a non-profit uh, community for young scholars to freely and equally build connections, promote their work and share their thoughts. We mainly have four types of events. The Mars Talk, talk, uh, just like the event today, uh, mainly focuses on sharing knowledge, scientific research, or popularization of science. The WBA talk uh, is uh, more uh, talking about the stories in the world beyond academia. Uh, the, the, uh, the workshop, uh, TMS workshop is to help young scholars to develop their skill sets. And we also have a special issues to invite uh, guests who usually share their career, career stories that may inspire our young scholars to think about different career paths. Okay, so talking about the special issue, there is a short advertisement for a special issue, not in our event list, but in the journal uh, Biomimetics. It is currently launching a, a special issue entitled with the mechanical properties of uh, biomaterials. I'm working with uh, Professor Wei Huang from Huazhong University of Science and Technology as guest editors. The scope of this uh, 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 special issue is quite broad. Uh, including but not limited to like the mechanical responses of uh, biomimetics, sorry, uh, and uh, fracture impact behaviors, uh, 3D printing, adhesion, uh, tribology, uh, characterization, uh, bioinspiration, and biomineralization. So the submission deadline is about like uh, it's uh, 28 February next year. So. Uh, well, you, you guys are welcome to submit any uh, review articles or research articles related to this uh, field. Okay, so thank you guys and sorry for taking your uh, valuable time. Uh, now I will pass it to Iran and uh, she will introduce our guest speaker. Great, thank you, Hao Chen. Um, so Dr. Nicole Black um, is the Vice President of Biomaterials and Innovation for Desktop Health. Nicole graduated with her PhD from Harvard University in 2020, having conducted her thesis in the labs of Professor Jennifer Lewis and, and Dr. Aaron Raymond Schneider. Prior to pursuing a PhD, Nicole obtained a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering with a minor in Mechanical Engineering from Boston University. During grad school, Nicole worked on interdisciplinary projects between the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering and Mass Eye and Ear Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Specifically, she focused on developing biomimetic tympanic um, membrane graphs using novel materials and 3D printing technologies. Following grad school, Nicole co-founded Beacon Bio, a startup company working on regenerative, regenerative tissue graphs that benefit from 3D printed architectures, starting with the phonograph device, a novel graph for timpani um, membrane repair. Beacon Bio was acquired by Desktop Metal in summer 2021. Nicole currently leads a team of 10 people in Desktop Health, a healthcare division of Desktop, Desktop Metal, to bring the phonograph device and other in innovative um, medical devices to patients. Nicole was named a collegiate um, Inventors Competition Graduate Team winner in 2018, a Baxter Young Investigator Prize winner in 2020, and a Lemonson MIT Student Prize winner in 2021, and a Forbes 30 Under 30 Lister in Manufacturing and Industry for 2022. 
So um, great. So now I'm going to pass the stage to um, Dr. Nicole Black to start her awesome talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yaren, and thank you, Hao Cheng, and all of the organizers. Um, what a lovely society and, and group and mission that you guys have, and I'm very honored to be speaking today about some of our work. Um, and so uh, I am currently the Vice President of Biomaterials and Innovation at Desktop Health. So thank you so much to um, Yuren for the great introduction. Um, but a lot of the work that I'm gonna be presenting is um, from my PhD at Harvard. Um, so as Yuren mentioned, I was in the labs of Professor Jennifer Lewis, who is a professor of uh, material science and engineering um, in Harvard Seas and the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Um, and I was also working under uh, the lab of Dr. Aaron Riemann Schneider, um, yeah, his last name is very long, um, at Mass Ioneer Hospital. Um, I also worked with uh, some other uh, professors there, including uh, Dr. Elliot Kozin and Dr. Uh, Tao Chang as well, um, who contributed uh, to advising some of this work. Um, and so uh, my background from the beginning, so I'm actually originally from um, Michigan, so grew up around suburban Detroit for most of my life. Um, I, you know, first started getting interested in engineering and uh, first robotics, so I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that. Um, and I did um, uh, a summer at uh, TARDEX, so the U.S. Army um, Tank Automotive and Armament command as well. Um, I then went to Boston University for undergrad, um, yeah, where I studied biomedical engineering. I worked uh, in many different labs, um, ultimately decided I really liked the fields of biomaterials and tissue engineering. Um, I really liked being able to design materials to heal the body in new ways and think about how different uh, material properties impact um, the, the, the structure and the function of uh, different medical devices. And so I worked in several labs there um, and including uh, at University of Sydney. I also worked at a biomaterials lab there as well. Um, I did a summer internship between undergraduate uh, studies and graduate school um, funded through the Mass Life Science Foundation. And there I worked at um, a startup company that was developing drug eluding implants for epilepsy. Um, really discovered that I liked the startup environment and being able to, you know, innovate and see things come to life um, so quickly. Um, and so ultimately, you know, that helped push me toward the startup path. Um, in graduate school, as I mentioned, I uh, was working on these collaborative projects between uh, the VIS and uh, Mass Ioneer Hospital, so had a great um, team in both of these labs um, that really helped with it um, and was able to, you know, um, even talk about some of my inventions at um, uh, the USPTO uh, and with some events uh, around that through the Collegiate Inventors Competition, which was pretty neat. Um, in 2020, um, really started uh, launching this venture after I uh, graduated with my PhD. Um, so we utilized a lot of um, resources in the Boston area um, for startup companies. So in particular, the Harvard Innovation Labs um, and a program that was called Activate that's now called Nucleate um, for biotech startups and is now uh, having, has a global presence as well. So if any of you guys have a biotech startup and we can have some Q&A at the end if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, but I encourage you to check out that program. Um, again, it's called Nucleate now. Uh, we're also in a fantastic program um, through the Mass Medic organization called Ignite, um, which helped um, launch that company as well. So um, yeah, essentially um, the startup company ended up being acquired by Desktop Metal in 2021. Um, so now I'm working within this uh, healthcare division of Desktop Metal called Desktop Health. So um, what I'd like to talk about today is really, um, you know, how do you go about uh, from thinking about a medical device, um, some unfulfilled need that you have um, to actually bringing it to patients and what are the steps involved around this? So um, I sort of structured this in the context of um, these novel eardrum graphs that I was working on during graduate school, um, but from, you know, a commercial lens and how do you bring something from, you know, understanding that the surgeon has a problem to actually creating a product and what are the steps that go into this. And so starting off, the first um, step in this process that I want identify and want to go through with you guys is, is defining patient and surgeon needs. So when you're you know, innovating in the biomedical space, you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're creating is actually needed by the surgeons and end users of it. Um, 
And so you really need to first understand what the problems are that you're solving and what the tissues are involved in this um, at an anatomical level. So in our case, um, we were really motivated to start this project um, as a result of the um, 2013 Boston Marathon bombing. So um, as a result of this event, there were more than 50 patients that had perforated eardrums or tympanic membranes, as they're also called. Um, and one of our surgeon collaborators, Dr. Rima Schneider, um, treated a lot of patients from this event and um, noticed um, their poor outcomes over time. And so really started to think, you know, what more about the eardrum and what makes it unique. And so the, the eardrum or tympanic membrane is a thin tissue. It's about the size of a dime um, and about, you know, 80 to 100 microns in thickness that captures sound waves from the environment and conducts this uh, to these three little ossicles or bones in your middle ear. Um, a lot of the function of your eardrum has to do with the area ratio um, between the eardrum itself and the oval window, which is essentially um, a thin membrane uh, for your cochlea that vibrates the fluid there. So essentially, um, the air particles vibrating vibrate your eardrum, which vibrate those ossicles, which vibrate the oval window and the fluid in your cochlea. So this is essentially how sound is conducted from the environment into your inner ear. And so your eardrum actually has a very complex structure to it. So in its middle layer, which is known as the lamina propria, it has this complex uh, layer of collagen fibers um, in a circular and radial orientation. And so on the right here, um, you can see um, essentially a scanning electron microscopy image of what these fibers look like. Um, so you can tell there's this very um, you know, discrete layer of circular fibers on the more medial side or middle ear facing side. And then um, these uh, radial fibers on top of that on the more lateral surface. And unfortunately, like the Boston Marathon bombing, your, your eardrum can become damaged in a variety of ways. Um, and so everything, you know, from traumatic injuries like blast waves and sticking cotton swabs in your ear and things like that, um, you can also suffer from barotrauma. So if you go scuba diving without equalizing your ear pressure, if you go skydiving, uh, this can cause rapid changes in pressure that can um, cause your eardrum to burst. Um, also, a common uh, reason for perforations is, is chronic ear infections. So especially in children when their eustachian tubes are still developing and they can't quite equalize their middle ear pressure well, uh, there can be a buildup of a lot of fluid in the middle ear that could eventually cause your eardrum to rupture. And worldwide, there's about 30 million uh, TM perforations um, every year that occur. Um, a majority of these do heal on their own, but some fraction of these um, actually, you know, leave a permanent hole in your eardrum. Um, and this is really not ideal um, because essentially you can't capture sound waves as well as I initially initially, you know, talked about, but also you have this uh, channel open to your middle ear space where water and pathogens can get in and cause pain and infections for the patient. So, you know, if you have a, a chronic perforation like this, um, really the patient is going to want to undergo um, a procedure to fix it. Uh, and so this procedure is typically known as tympanoplasty. And so currently for tympanoplasty procedures, these tissue grafts are uh, harvested from the patient themselves. So they're usually harvested um, from uh, essentially uh, temporalis fascia or the temporalis muscle um, on your um, head kind of behind your ear. Um, there's an area peeled back and this uh, piece of tissue is harvested. Harvesting this tissue takes additional surgeon time and it also creates an additional site for scarring and infections to occur. Once this tissue graft is harvested, it's usually placed on the medial surface um, of the eardrum and becomes integrated with the remaining tissue around it. Unfortunately, these autologous tissue grafts, such as fascia and sometimes cartilage and fat grafts, don't actually degrade or remodel. So essentially what you put in at day one is what you have in your ear for the rest of your life. Um, and so, um, you know, you can see even though the perforations often close, it's usually more of like a superficial band-aid that's held onto the back of your um, eardrum and, you know, doesn't have the right uh, properties as your normal eardrum. So here's a quick video showing what that procedure typically looks like. So um, the surgeon will essentially create this incision, um, peel back the remnant eardrum, and then place that uh, autologous graft, again, usually typically fascia, behind that perforation. And so um, I mentioned, started off this section saying that um, we really need to understand what the surgeon and patient needs are to improve a procedure like this. Um, and so we actually... Um, 
Dr. Riemann Schneider uh, was able to uh, follow some of these patients from the Boston Marathon bombings and look at their outcomes and see how they fared over time. And um, he found that a lot of these current impanoplasty procedures were not ideal because quite a few of them required a revision surgery after the fact. So after about a year after the Boston Marathon bombing, about 14% of patients need another revision surgery. And five years later, more than half of those that he was able to follow up with um, required a revision surgery. This can be due to a variety of causes, one of which is graft retraction. So these autologous tissue grafts, again, not truly integrating into the tissue and peeling away, but there can also be structural defects depending on how the surgeon is harvesting these um, that can essentially lead to um, the graft uh, breaking at certain points and leading to persistent perforations. In addition to healing outcomes being poor, um, hearing outcomes following tympanoplasty can also be poor. And so this can be due to, you know, these grafts being different thickness um, that are harvested by the surgeon. As I mentioned earlier, your eardrum is usually about 80 to 100 microns in thickness. And a lot of these autologous graft tissues can be substantially thicker than that. There can also be a mismatched architecture here because um, essentially these fascia grafts and, and cartilage grafts don't have this complex circular and radial architecture that's important for um, eardrum vibration. And so what you're looking at here are some uh, example audiograms of a patient uh, with a perforated eardrum before they underwent tympanoplasty and afterward. And um, it, I'm sure many of you have not seen audiograms too much. Um, so essentially what you're looking at is these um, uh, more of like square brackets are uh, essentially the, the bone conduction. So what is, is reaching uh, your ear through, um, if you have headphones that just essentially vibrate your skull, um, to uh, air conduction, which is the X's. And so air conduction is normal headphones, the sound coming through your ear canal and through your eardrum. So if there's a difference um, between where these square brackets and these X brackets sit um, for each frequency, this suggests that there's something called an air bone gap, or there's some form of conductive hearing loss um, problem in your middle ear. And so you can see for this patient, for example, before tympanoplasty, they had pretty significant airbone gap at most frequencies that tended to close um, after tympanoplasty, especially at lower frequencies. However, at higher frequencies, even after tympanoplasty, you can see starting at around 3,000 hertz and then 4,000 hertz, um, this airbone gap persists. And, um, you know, in some cases, uh, this high frequency hearing, um, you know, might not go away. Um, and so the reason for this really could be this, this mismatch in properties of these materials. And so to understand more what the what problems, you know, are really underlying uh, these graphs and, and what problems surgeons are having with these, um, we interviewed 52 ear, nose, and throat surgeons in eight countries. Um, and we found out that, that one of their number one issues was with manipulation and placement of graph materials. So they usually have to harvest these um, materials, as I mentioned, uh, lay them very flat, and then place them um, you know, usually under a patient that um, has undergone anesthesia, and this procedure can take, you know, usually one and a half to two hours uh, from beginning to end um, because of how challenging placing these graphs are. Um, and then we also asked them common reasons why a patient would require vision surgery. So as we talked about earlier, healing outcomes being not ideal, so the graft reperforating, but then a number of patients also undergo revision surgeries just due to poor hearing outcomes as well. And so the reason for these poor hearing outcomes, as I mentioned, is likely because these graphs do not degrade or remodel. And so the normal human eardrum, here's a cross section um, showing, you know, it's about 80 microns in thickness. And you can see very clearly um, these uh, two layers of the lamina propria of the, those radial and circular collagen fibers that I talked about. However, if you take an eardrum that has been replaced with something like fascia and look at um, that under um, a similar histological section, you can see, for example, this graft is quite a bit thicker. It's about 160 microns. And additionally, it doesn't have this um, uh, bilaminar structure to it. It really has just a, a linear sequence of these original fibers that were present in the fascia itself. So again, this is showing that, you know, pretty much whatever piece of autologous tissue you're going to put in, um, it's going to keep that same structure and it's not going to remodel into the native architecture. 
And so why is this architecture important for sound conduction? Um, you know, really your body has engineered this to be able to um, have your eardrum uh, behave more of like a soft material at lower frequencies and more of like a stiff material uh, at high frequencies. So as you can see, this is a um, computational uh, modeling experiment by um, Sunil Paria's group um, that's now at Mass Ioneer. They were at Stanford where they modeled the eardrum um, first as, you know, a normal orthotropic tissue. So with its normal properties you see in black um, and looked at essentially, you know, what is the uh, amount of um, pressure that ends up being transferred from your ear canal to the vestibule of your cochlea. So that's that PV over PEC is the pressure in your vestibule over the pressure in your cochlea uh, that's normal or in your ear canal that's normalized. And so essentially by comparing this uh, to a TM that's been modeled as a completely soft material. So in green here, you can see it's been modeled as an isotropic tissue with about um, a 30 megapascal stiffness. Um, you can see at low frequencies, it can vibrate very well, but at high High frequencies, um, it drops off a lot. It can't actually uh, move the ossicles all that well. Um, whereas, you know, the converse is true if you have just a purely stiff eardrum. So something like cartilage with a stiffness closer to 100 megapascals. Um, at high frequencies, you can see it vibrates pretty similar to the normal eardrum, but at low frequencies, um, there's a pretty significant uh, decrease in the amount of pressure that can be transferred because essentially um, it can't match the impedance of the air, this very stiff tissue. And so your body has really engineered this um, orthotropic structure whereby at lower frequencies, like around 500 Hertz, um, it vibrates uh, in a single mode of motion as sort of one sheet. And then at higher frequencies, so closer to around 10,000 Hertz, it has these more complex modes of motion that uh, sum together to move the ossicles. And so once we've understood really what these patient and surgeon needs are, so in our case, being able to place these uh, graphs better to promote better healing that is more representative of the thickness of the real eardrum and then to really mimic this orthotropic circular radio architecture. Then we can start to think about what are some predicate devices. So what this means is, you know, looking at the landscape and seeing um, what other devices are out there that are trying to solve these challenges. And, um, you know, going through this regulatory process, how can you compare yourself to these different devices and show that you're substantially equivalent? Um, so in the, you know, in the U.S. at least, um, there's uh, three main classes of medical devices. So class one, two, and three. Um, so class one medical devices are things that are considered to be relatively low risk. So things like, you know, uh, tongue dispressors, wheelchairs, um, different types of surgical tools that a patient, you know, likely wouldn't hurt themselves um, when using, doesn't present uh, many high risk, um, life uh, altering risks for the patient. Class three medical devices are the most intense uh, implantable devices. So um, these are, you know, different, um, you know, types of heart valves, um, knee implants, hip implants, um, things where if this implant were to catastrophically fail, it would cause significant harm to the patient. In between these are what's known as class two. So these tend to be, you know, things that interact with the body um, and can be implantable, but you know, are maybe perhaps implanted in places with lower risk. So um, eardrum grafts fall into this category because it's implanted into the body onto the, the tissue of the eardrum. Um, but they, you know, are essentially, it's, it's your eardrum, it's hearing, um, you know, while this is a very important sense, um, if your eardrum graft fails, you know, the patient is, isn't going to be in, put in any uh, life altering situation. So, you know, one of the first things you have to do when designing a medical device is decide sort of which class this fits into because that, will then determine um, the pathway that you follow from there. So if you have a class two device, you have an option to go down this pathway called the 510K clearance. Um, and so for 510K, as I mentioned, you have to see what other devices are out there that could be used as a predicate device. So in our case, um, we are uh, looking at, you know, for example, this product by Cook Medical um, called BioDesign, um, which is a porcine, porcine small intestinal submucosa material. Um, and so essentially by identifying that this product is out there and is used, um, you know, for tympanic membrane repair um, and its indications for use specifically, it says um, aid uh, the natural healing process in various otologic procedures, including but not limited to moringoplasty and tympanoplasty. Um, we can then, um, you know, call this an, a, an equivalent device for our application and uh, look at what testing that underwent. The other thing you want to look at when considering predicate devices is how these devices are placed um, and, you know, if there's any, you know, 
perhaps improvements that you could make around this as well. So as I mentioned earlier in the current standard of care for tympanoplasty, uh, you'll generally make this incision behind the ear, um, lay the graft in, and then put packing material both on that medial side, uh, middle ear facing side. This is generally a gel foam material that degrades. Uh, and then in the lateral side of the eardrum, like the, the ear canal to really hold that graft onto the eardrum. Um, and so with the phonograph device, you know, we've been looking at other geometries and ways of thinking about placing this that are less invasive as well. So really going back to those, um, you know, surgeon needs that we defined earlier and thinking about um, what what makes uh, what would make this device superior to what's out there. So um, a lot of the surgeons I mentioned uh, had trouble with handling and placement of graphs. So what if we could improve that as well? So after you've uh, really defined your predicate devices and um, you know essentially how your device is going to be used, um, you also want to think about what are gonna be the materials that are used in your device. So this was really the focus of my PhD work. Um, and you know I think materials are a very important part of any medical device. Um, and so uh, really encourage, you know, in our group, um, our team to think of creative ways to use materials um, and combine materials to uh, have cool new properties. And so when you're thinking about an eardrum graft, what properties do you really want in this and what do you want to consider? Um, so really um, in our case, we wanna consider manufacturability. So in mimicking the circular and radial structure of the eardrum, we uh, chose to pursue 3D printing. Um, so essentially uh, a way to mimic um, the circular and radial architecture through um, extrusion. We also aimed for a device that's biodegradable. So since this device is going to be um, in your eardrum, um, there's a few reasons for biodegradation, um, one of which is that the tissue can actually um, truly integrate as the device goes away. Um, and secondly, because um, your ear is just sort of a naturally very dirty place, um, it's exposed to the environment, so a lot of biofilms can form on foreign devices. So if you have a device that's biodegradable, um, you can actually eliminate a lot of those sites for foreign infections um, and rejection to occur. Um, looking at the mechanical properties, there's a few um, lenses we want to look at this through, but you know, one of which is how do we match this um, anisotropic stiffness in the eardrum and um, you know, create these mechanical properties whereby it's it's a similar stiffness um, to the eardrum itself for improved um, acoustic performance. Um, but then also looking at handleability. So how can the surgeon manipulate these graphs and make sure that they're not going to break as the device is being placed? You also want to look at precedence. So are these materials used out there and other devices safely in the body? And then, um, you know, ultimately biocompatibility. So what, um, you know, what, what does the biocompatibility of this material look like, especially as it degrades on um, what can those degradation products be? So when we were looking at the TM graft, um, for surgical feasibility, we wanted, you know, this graft to be around the same um, thickness as the eardrum. Um, so like starting at about 80 microns and be able to with withstand um, a bunch of flexing as it's placed through the ear canal. We wanted a Young's modulus that's in the range of the normal eardrum. So it was about 10 to 100 megapascals. And we wanted this graft to start to degrade, you know, in about two to six months. Um, we also aimed for good acoustic properties of these eardrums. So being able to vibrate across the wide range of frequencies that you and I can normally hear. So generally considered to be about 20 Hertz on the lower end up to 20 kilohertz on the higher end. Um, and then not just um, vibrate at these frequencies, but over time as this graph degrades, be able to guide tissue so that it would match this architecture and be replaced by tissue in this architecture over time. And then finally, since eardrum perforations come in many sizes and locations, um, having a solution that, you know, is versatile and, you know, maybe not exactly patient matched because um, it's, you know, a little bit more complicated from a regulatory perspective, which I'll talk about in a bit, but such that the graphs could be altered um, for these different perforation sizes and locations. So um, when designing a material, we designed um, a new polyurethane. So um, we decided to pursue polyurethanes because they are um, essentially thermoplastic um, elastomers, or they can be when designed the right way. Um, and so these elastomers can have similar properties to uh, soft tissue in your body. Um, so especially your eardrum, as I mentioned, is about 10 to 100 megapascals in stiffness. So, uh, you know, on the softer end. Um, and so how can we create a material that, that will mimic this? Um, so polyurethanes um, are unique because they have essentially two um, blocks in them. So a macro 
nitrodiol component and a diisocyanate that are reacted together to form a urethane bond. And these urethane bonds um, can really hydrogen bond with each other um, across these chains, forming these physical crosslinks. Um, and so in this way, the material can behave like an elastomer. So, you know, unlike a silicone that has chemical crosslinks, allowing it to stretch and go back to its original configuration, um, a polyurethane has these physical crosslinks where uh, by you can stretch it and it will return, but um, you can design it to be melted as well. And they have this Young's modulus in the range of the eardrum. And so thinking more about, uh, you know, these polyurethanes and how we can then develop cool. biodegradation. Um, so we looked at, you know, incorporating a few different types of bonds into these polymer chains that can undergo um, a method mechanism called hydrolysis, whereby these um, bonds will essentially um, fracture with the help of water molecules coming in uh, and degrade um, over time. And so biodegradable polyurethanes have been used successfully in a wide variety of in vitro and in vivo applications. So so um, everything from fibroblasts, um, HUVAX, which are uh, human uh, vascular endothelial cell line, um, and a smooth muscle cell line um, that have uh, been successfully shown to grow on these, um, as well as uh, being implanted at various um, locations. So this was a study where uh, they implanted some uh, polyester urethane urea patches um, into the um, lesions of, of rat hearts and looked at how the uh, cardiovascular tissue integrated there. So overall, biodegradable polyurethanes are really interesting class of materials, um, but most of them, you know, have uh, this melting temperature that doesn't uh, make them as easy to process um, with melt extrusion 3D printing, for example. So we essentially innovated this new uh, material system um, whereby we uh, reacted um, these PCL diols with these uh, degradable ester groups with a diisocyanate, um, forming these polyester urethanes. Um, we can then combine those with a chain extender um, called diaminobutane um, and essentially lengthen the chains on these. And what we end up with at the end of the day is a polyester urethane urea material, um, which can be um, extruded under uh, high temperature. So we essentially um, have this ink system uh, whereby we have uh, this biodegradable polymer um, polyurethane and then we also uh, mix in a water soluble component um, and extrude um, via this melt extrusion process. So essentially whereby you have this molten polymer in the syringe, apply pressure and the material begins to be extruded. So we compared a bunch of ink classes. So the PEUU is that polyurethane um, and the PCL is uh, an off the shelf polycaprolactone um, with and without um, this water soluble component um, with the idea that this water soluble component could aid in degradation. So um, after the fact, this component could be removed and then um, more uh, body fluids and enzymes could go into the graft to aid in hydrolysis. And so um, we're able to create these inks ultimately that have these um, really cool um, shear thinning properties as well, which essentially means um, as the shear rate um, on these materials increases, their viscosity decrease. And um, so essentially trying to squeeze this material out of a small nozzle, um, you can get it to be deposited. And so this is one of the polyurethane inks um, being printed from a custom um, hot direct ink right setup we have. Um, and so we're able to create four, these four inks um, that can be patterned turned into, um, you know, these circular and radial architectures at high resolution. Um, over time, um, as I mentioned, we're interested in developing something degradable. So really the benefit of this water soluble component that we leached out um, was to uh, uh, increase the degradation rate of these materials. So you can see um, on the left in just a PBS solution, um, the P materials in the front of them with that water soluble component degrade at a faster rate than their counterparts without it. And this um, can be accelerated by, for example, testing graphs in a lipase solution um, to try to mimic the degradation um, that occurs in the body. And so we didn't wa just want, you know, to create this nice architecture with 3D printing. We wanted it to have a functional value. And so in Jennifer's lab, there have been several grad students who've been doing uh, very uh, interesting work with um, programming and isotropy into materials via this extrusion-based 3D printing. So on the left is um, a paper from Sydney Gladman, um, where she was creating essentially these um, hydrogel 
40 shape changing flowers, um, whereby she had a hydrogel ink system and included these cellulose nanofibrils in it, that due to these high forces, shear stresses in the nozzle would actually um, align with the print path. So essentially these filaments would differentially swell depending on where these cellulose fibrils were sitting. And you could create these cool shape changing architectures. Um, on the right is a paper from uh, Arda Kotikian, um, also in the Lewis lab, who was using um, hot extrusion uh, printing of liquid crystal elastomers um, to essentially align uh, these uh, liquid crystal, liquid crystal uh, elastomer domains uh, within it um, and essentially create these uh, shape changing um, soft robotic actuators. So depending on the print path, as these are heated and cooled, um, you can actually change uh, the, the shape of these graphs and essentially create these little robotic systems. And so we wanted to do something similar, um, but with these polyurethane materials. And so um, one thing uh, that we wanted to be able to do was to um, encourage these materials to be stiffer, essentially parallel to the print path uh, rather than perpendicular. And so, um, you know, we hypothesized that by applying these very high shear stresses in the nozzle, we could achieve something similar uh, in terms of mechanical anisotropy. So we printed these dog bone specimens for tensile testing, either parallel to the print path or, or perpendicular. And then you can test out, you know, the, the relative stiffness of them. And so what we were essentially able to see is that in these polyurethane materials, um, both with and without this uh, water soluble component, we were able to achieve um, mechanical anisotropy and that these graphs were actually stiffer um, along the print path um, rather than um, than they were orthogonal to the print path. So unlike with PCL um, graphs that we saw um, where they were pretty much mechanically anisotropic, these polyurethanes actually um, had this stiffer behavior. And ultimately, um, you know, we wanted to compare these stiffness values to that of the eardrums. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we we're aiming for about a 10 to 100 megapascal stiffness. Um, and so we were able to um, achieve this and um, with these polyurethane ink systems and get them to be in the relevant uh, physiological stiffness for the eardrum. The other property I talked about that's important is handleability. So even though, you know, this is an elastomer, we wanted to make sure that this is a material that could be um, easily manipulated and placed. So um, this is just a video um, of a graft being manipulated by one of the surgeons. And you can see that um, it's very resilient, uh, can handle a lot of different flexing into locations into the ear. Um, Precedent. So this is another thing that I talked about. Um, so you want to, um, you know, ensure that the material systems that you're using um, have precedent in other medical devices. So polyurethanes are a class of materials um, that, you know, uh, has safety summaries even published by the FDA about it. So um, if you're considering, you know, uh, using a new material in a medical device, sometimes the FDA will already have some guidance around how it can be used and how much of it can be present in the medical device. Um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure of is that, you know, there was precedent for using these um, polyurethanes and other medical devices as well. Um, so there's a wide variety out there of, um, you know, medical devices, both in the US, Europe, Canada, Australia, that use different biodegradable polyurethanes. And then um, also biocompatibility. So, you know, I mentioned not just precedent, but you actually have to go through this full suite of biocomp tests for any new material you're planning. So um, these are a lot of tests um, that, you know, we've started to undertake with some versions of our materials, but um, overall um, you'll usually work with a partner that, um, um, essentially uh, a contract research organization that will run these tests for you, um, but it's a wide variety of cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, sensitization, um, you know, subacute, subchronic testing as well. Um, there's also other testing that you have to do in the materials, um, which is called extractables and leachables. Um, so in addition to those, you know, more standard um, uh, tests that uh, the FDA requires, they also, um, as part of ISO 10993, require um, extractables and leachables testing, whereby you have to put your device in three different solvents, um, a nonpolar, uh, a polar, and a midpolar solvent, and then see what chemicals essentially come out of that device. Um, and then you essentially can, um, you know, uh, quantify based on how much of these different materials come out if, if they're at toxic levels um, in the device. So, Thought this might be useful to give you sort of an idea of, of, of what you can and can't put in the body and, and what um, these materials have to undergo because you know when you're designing things for med devices, obviously many cool innovations that can be used, but ultimately, you know, what's going to be safe in the body is, is important to find out. 
So um, one of the you know, next things you want to think about is, is scaling up the manufacturing of the device and how feasible this is. So in part of our testing, you know, we were uh, really trying to nail down what um, the print parameters of these inks were. So when we extruded them at different pressures, um, different nozzle diameters and print speeds, um, what these different filament widths would come out with and if they would be reproducible. Um, so with something like 3D printing, um, you know, you obviously want to use as quality of a machine as you can. Um, we've been very fortunate that since I was in grad school and using this custom setup, we've now are using the 3D Bioplotter by Envision Tech, uh, which is a very, um, you know, great uh, piece of machinery that uh, gives very reproducible prints, um, very easy to program and, you know, essentially great for medical device manufacturing because of how reproducible it is and, and quality the hardware is. So um, this is an extrusion based printer again, where you can um, load whatever material, um, whether it's a polymer or a hydrogel that you could cross link after the fact uh, into the barrel, um, apply pressure essentially um, to squeeze that material out and pattern it um, however you'd like. So um, there's really two methods um, to consider, or two main things to consider when you're uh, designing the device and the manufacturing process. So um, these terms are, are called verification and validation. So verification, uh, essentially a word that is used to describe um, if the product was built right. So if the product meets the dimensions that you were aiming for, um, if this is essentially what it is, uh, ends up being what you wanted to make. The other part of this is validation. So this is whether the right product was built. So does this product uh, basically satisfy those user needs that you had defined at the beginning? So at the beginning, we talked about, you know, surgeons being able to handle these graphs better, healing rates um, being better, hearing outcomes being better. These are all things around validation. So is this the um, correct device to actually help patients? Um, and so for verification itself in the manufacturing process, um, you know, this is really important for 3D printing because as a new manufacturing method, you want to ensure that the prints you're creating are consistent batch to batch. And so this is a big, can be a big concern to the FDA. So we um, in our uh, group are using this um, Kian's um, laser profilometry system to very closely look at um, what these graphs look like, what the thickness is um, between batches and, um, you know, very easy be able to verify that the thickness is are what we intended them to be. And then for validation, um, there's a variety of efficacy testing that we do that I'll talk about next. Other considerations, um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, 3D printing can be challenging if you're trying to patient match. So this is why, you know, for our initial devices, we're going to have a set, standard set of sizes in a kit, uh, because once you start having patient matching, you have essentially an endless um, you know, design uh, spectrum of, of sizes and shapes uh, that could be created. Um, so you really have to carefully define what this could be and verify um, many different scenarios of those devices within it. So, um, you know, I know a lot of people when they think of 3D printing, think of customization um, and this patient matching uh, ability, but it is much more challenging from a regulatory perspective because, you know, you, instead of now having to verify and validate three different, you know, sizes of device, you now have this more or less um, continuous spectrum that you could be innovating within. And so um, the FDA has recently released um, a discussion paper about 3D printing of medical device at the point of care. If you're interested in this, I encourage you to check that out um, and look at um, look into this regulatory process. And so um, once you've scaled up manufacturing and you know that, um, you know, you're creating the right devices that you're intending to, um, on your final finish uh, in manufactured devices, you can start to perform efficacy testing. So, um, you know, is this device going to meet these intended purposes and are you going to be able to validate it? So, um, again, uh, we uh, have this uh a uh, trilaminar structure in your eardrum in the, in the middle of which is uh, these human fibroblast cells. And so one of our methods of validation uh, is ensuring that we're creating this, um, recreating this structure in the eardrum with fibroblasts. Um, and so efficacy testing is, um, you know, really to um, objectively uh, check or confirm the performance of a given product with specific instruments or scientific techniques. Um, so there's two different, you know, real tests of efficacy type uh, types of tests that you can do. Um, there's in vitro tests. So this is, you know, looking at how the device uh, performs, you know, in, outside of the body in different contexts. And then in vivo tests that really look at how this is performing in the relevant um, organism. 
Um, and so for some of our in vitro tests, um, we wanted to look at how cells align um, and remodel these different graphs. So we were able to um, print these essentially little squares of the different materials, uh, whereby the top surface um, has this, you know, uh, essentially uh, mountains, peaks, valleys, topography, and then the bottom is topographically flat. And using this, we can look at cell alignment to see if we are inducing um, cell alignment on one or both of these surfaces. So we would essentially take these graphs, um, seed um, a GFP expressing fibroblast line onto them, um, fix these scaffolds um, in amino stain for collagen one to see how that's being deposited. And you can run them through um, a software program called ImageJ to look at the directionality um, of the cell alignment and collagen alignment, either along the print path, which it would give a peak at zero, or orthogonal to the print path, um, which would be at uh, negative and positive 90 degrees. And so this is um, an example of the plots that we end up getting um, for fibroblast alignment and collagen alignment, um, both you know, on the top of these graphs, um, which you can see with the gray lines, a very sharp peak. Um, so a lot of these cells are sitting in these little valleys between the, the filaments. Um, but still on the bottom surface of the graph, we were able to get cell alignment, likely due to this mechanical anisotropy in the graphs themselves. Um, even when... Uh, uh, interestingly, these graphs are melted. You see that this disappears, suggesting that something in the printing itself um, is actually guiding this cell alignment process. And so you can extrapolate this beyond squares and create more complex architectures um, that can encourage um, cell alignment along more complex structures. So taking a circular and radial graph, for example, we can see on the bottom surface that's been printed in circles, uh, we get this uh, nice collagen cell alignment in a circular direction versus on the top surface of the graph um, that has been 3D printed radially, you can get um, you know, this radial alignment here. Um, so last a bit of this is, um, you know, how do we test this in animals? So um, we ended up using an animal model called the chinchilla, uh, which has a similar size eardrum to humans and a similar hearing range as well. Um, so we take these chinchillas, um, we create a perforation in their eardrum and wait about, you know, two to four weeks to make sure it's chronic. Uh, and then we can repair it with different graph materials. So one of which is the tolagus fascia. So this is what I mentioned is commonly uh, used as a standard of care, um, harvested from the chinchillas. Um, Biodesign, which I mentioned is that predicate device by Cook Medical, that porcine small intestinal submucosa um, that already exists on the market. And then our biomimetic graphs. Um, so in this case, this was the um, polyurethanes with that fugitive component uh, printed in this 50 circular and 50 radial pattern. So this is a complete, um, completely synthetic acellular graft that's implanted. And what we're able to see is that, um, you know, essentially after three months, the fascia and biodesign graphs do close the perforation, um, but you can see that the graph material is still there and it hasn't really remodeled into any new type of tissue. It's just sort of like a tissue bandage on that original perforation. However, in the case of the biomimetic 3D printed polyurethane graphs, you can see this graft um, actually integrating into the native tissue and you can see ingrowth of native vasculature as well. So um, this tissue is actually, um, you know, reformed to look like that original print path. And so in that manner, we've actually programmed um, the restructuring of this tissue by programming just the print path of the graft, which is very interesting because we can start to think, you know, about other tissues in the body where this structure, especially microstructure, is important to its function. And so, you know, looking at a cross section um, histologically um, of fascia versus in biodesign, again, you can see these both close the perforation, but, um, you know, you don't really see um, any sort of complex um, uh, trilaminar structure reforming, especially um, that collagen uh, layer. Um, however, with the polyurethane graphs, um, you can see not only is the perforation healed, but you can see that the graph material is starting degrading um, and integrating. It's about you know uh, 30 to 40 microns thick after three months, um, so about a 60 70 percent degradation from its original thickness. Um, as you know, you see ingrowth of uh, new collagen fibers and fibroblasts as well. And overall, with these graphs, we were even able to see a higher healing rate. So 80 percent of the perforations uh, treated with these graphs healed versus to only 62 and 66 percent for the control groups. Um, the only or the other thing that we wanted to look at was um, ototoxicity. So since it's a biodegradable material in your ear is a very sensitive space, you want to make sure that there's no toxicity to these sensitive um, cell populations in there. So we also did histology on the organ of Cordy and the population of spiral ganglion neurons. Um, 
uh, which essentially are connected to your auditory nerve and send the signals um, uh, from hearing to your brain. And in all of these cases, all of the materials retained a healthy um, population of, of both spiral ganglion neurons and an intact organ of cordy, which is good and suggests, um, you know, no uh, ototoxicity of these materials. Um, the other thing that uh, functional test um, for efficacy testing that uh, we're performing is um, hearing testing. So there's two main hearing tests since you can't ask the chinchillas if they can hear. Um, one is called um, distortion product autoacoustic emissions or DPOAE, where you're essentially trying to figure out if sound reaches the cochlea. Uh, in the other one, which is auditory brainstem response, and this is a test they commonly do on babies, um, where you see if the sound waves reach the brain. So in both the cases, you'll play a single frequency louder and louder until either you can detect uh, these autoacoustic emissions in your cochlea for the case of DPOAE, or you can detect brain waves uh, in the case of ABR. And so when you can detect these, this is noted as a threshold. And so you can monitor these thresholds both initially um, and then three months following repair and compare um, how the hearing has improved over time. So in all of these plots, um, essentially values closer to zero are better because this means that the hearing has been restored closer to baseline levels. So in the case of DPOAE, um, you can see for fascia graphs and the biodesign, uh, there's still a substantial hearing loss um, of about you know, 30 to sometimes 50 decibels um, and most frequencies following uh, tympanoplasty, whereas with um, the 3D printed devices, um, it's closer to, you know, about 10 decibels. So substantially better hearing after this procedure closer to their normal letter levels. Um, so we see the same thing with auditory brainstem response. And interestingly, we even had a couple animals who at the highest frequency uh, had better hearing um, at that high frequency after the tympanoplasty than they did with their original eardrum. So this is suggesting we could possibly even use microstructure in the future to um, improve hearing and to uh, possibly modify the structure of the eardrum to create a more orthotropic structure for sound conduction. So um, overall, I hope this uh, gave uh, a good overview of, of what is really going into a medical device from beginning to end. So um, all of these things that you have to consider, you know, really, um, I presented this as a series, but a lot of these really come in parallel, especially thinking about materials and um, predicate devices and, and manufacturing all really play into each other. Um, and so these are all things that need to be considered and it's a, it can be a very lengthy process, um, but ultimately, you know, um, improving uh, patient welfare and patient outcomes from these uh, really require um, input in all of these areas. And so overall, as I mentioned, um, this work was mostly um, my PhD work at Harvard. So I'd um, like to thank you know, my advisors there. So Jennifer Lewis, um, my committee member, Dave Mooney. Um, I worked with um, Dr. Riemenschneider and Dr. Chang at Mass Ioneer. Um, and then a lot of the other collaborators along the way um, had some funding from uh, the NSF, um, the NIH, in some different foundations at Mass Ioneer and the Wies Institute as well. Um, so yeah, um, here uh, is my email address in my LinkedIn. If anyone is interested in connecting, I'm happy to do so in staying in touch. Um, so thank you so much again to all the organizers. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, please let me know. I'm happy to help answer them. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Nicole, for the awesome talk. Um, so now we're going to start on the Q&A session. If anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand and we can um, unmute you. And actually, I want to start a question. Are you testing on any of the patients now um, for, um, for, for your graft? Yeah, good question. So um, before you start putting the devices into humans, you really, you know, have to have a final form of it, um, final manufacturing condition. So that's something our team in desktop health is working on right now is finalizing that full manufacturing process. Um, but we are planning to conduct a small human study starting next summer um, with the primary outcome of perforation closure rates um, we're looking at. So it'll probably be around 15 patients um, out of a hospital in Massachusetts. So it's something we're actively planning right now and um, yeah, hope to, to start seeing uh, outcomes in, in human patients. Awesome. That's awesome. Any other questions people have? Can start sharing this. Uh, hi, Nicole. Very excellent talk. And I uh, just have a quick question. So uh, how do you fix your uh, uh, temporary memory at the graft to the uh, air drone? Or yeah. 
Snake sunshine, great question. So um, traditionally in tympanoplasty, when you harvest this graph material, um, you know, the most regenerative surface is that medial surface of your eardrum. So that um, surface, you know, you can essentially lay or sandwich a graft on. Um, and I can maybe, you know, pull up that slide again quickly, mm -hmm. um, but it will integrate into that medial mucosal layer. Um, in phonograft, you know, we in our team are experimenting with some different um, geometries that can allow it to almost like sandwich both sides of the eardrum. So, um, you know, there is one device out there that was used called the cartouche TM patcher, if you're curious. So it's sort of like an ear tube that sandwiches it. So in a similar mechanism. So ultimately what we're hoping to do is, you know, remove uh, the need for that patient to undergo, um, you know, a very invasive procedure where they need to pack both sides of the eardrum and, you know, place this other graph material and hopefully um, enable it so that a surgeon could just place this through the ear canal in an awake patient. Um, but yeah, good question. I'm still trying to, yeah, here it is. So you're not using any like glue or adhesive materials to? Yeah, really... uh, yeah, don't need any glue. Um, good question. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, you can essentially, um, you know, just lay this to that medial surface. And um, as long as it's sandwiched, um, your eardrum is a very regenerative tissue to begin with. Um, you mm -hmm. know, as I mentioned, a lot of eardrum perforations will normally heal on their, heal on their own, especially from ear tubes that fall out and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, you basically just need to physically affix it so that it's flush to the eardrum, but you don't need to use any sort of glue or anything like that. Yeah. All right, great. Um, yeah. great. Yeah, we have another uh, audience question, actually two. Um, firstly is, did you use chronic tympanic membrane animal model? And the second question is, could you please share your experience in terms of the animal model? Yeah, good question. Um, so yep, uh, we used um, yeah, a chronic uh, chinchilla model. So we use these because chinchillas have very large eardrums. Um, they're about eight millimeters in diameter and the human eardrum is about you know eight to 10, depending on the direction. And so what this means is that you can chronically perforate it and it won't heal on its own. Um, if you take something like a rat or a mouse, their eardrums are only about two millimeters in diameter. So no matter how much you perforate it, uh, it'll always heal naturally because those perforations about two millimeters and smaller, something you know around the size of an ear tube will usually heal on its own. Um, and yeah, in experience in terms of the animal model, um, yeah, chinchillas are, I guess, great to work with. We have an excellent um, research technician on our team named Patrick Holmes, who uh, works with our chinchillas and does a lot of these procedures. Um, you know, it, it can be tricky uh, to develop an animal model for some of these conditions because the anatomy um, in animals does not always match that in humans. And so getting something that replicates it well can be challenging, but at least in the case of the chinchilla, um, it's, it's nice that, that they exist because their ears are so similar to humans and they are still rodents. So you don't have to work with um, large animal models. Great, awesome. Um... Any more questions? If anyone, yeah, has any additional in the future you think of, feel free to email me or or add me on LinkedIn. Um, I can pull that up again quickly. Yeah, Jen, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hi, Nicole. I, I just have a very general question. I mean, I really like your style because you have a very specific problems and then you do all kinds of things to try to solve the requirements for this kind of engineering or uh, medical problems. But I'm just curious, like, because I also want to do some technology translation for my research, but sometimes it, I find it difficult to find the problems, you know? So I'm just curious, like, how you actually know the ISM medical needs there? Did you talk to some doctors or some- Yeah, experience? yeah, good, yeah. great question. Um, how do you find these needs? Um, so yeah, I, I would say just like talk to as many surgeons as you can. They're all very eager to tell you about the problems that they deal with um, yeah. because they actually really like working with engineers and, and seeing ways to solve these challenges. I mean, they're the ones day in and day out that have to deal with manipulating, you know, and placing these graphs, harvesting tissue. Um, they're, you know, it can sometimes be intimidating to reach out to a surgeon, but you'd be surprised how much they're willing to tell you and, you know, how much they really want to work, especially, you know, with PhD students and things like that to solve some yeah. of these questions. So in the case of our surgeons, they reached out. Um, initially, we were interested in thinking about 3D printing the ossicles or the bones in the middle ear and then talking more and more with them about the challenges that they faced, you know, especially with TM perforations and the Boston Marathon bombing. We discovered that, you know, this issue of TM graphs is, is bigger than, you know, they thought it would be. Um, and, you know, there is so much optimization. Um, yeah. 
around these that that could occur in in a half with three D printing. So, great. Right. Yeah, you. I have one last question from the audience. Um, it's about the balance. Uh, how do you balance the acoustic and mechanical properties of the graft? Is the um, Young's modulus sufficient already, or um, do you need to consider other things like pre-stress? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, with a biodegradable material, you know, at the end of the day, the mechanical properties are important, especially for handling and for initial healing. But, you know, more so what's important is long term over time. Um, if, you know, this this tissue is actually going to reform real tissue, because then you're interested in the mechanical properties of the real tissue and not just the graft to begin with. So um, we utilize, we try to have good um, responses um, for hearing. Um, and we were essentially able to match this like, you know, 10 to 100 me megapascal range and and have this anisotropy um, in these different directions. But really, you know, the anisotropy ended up being, you know, more valuable long-term for guiding cell growth and elongation along these print directions and remodeling it into tissue that matches it. So um, while, you know, ideal in the ideal world, you could match, you know, the mechanical properties of a tissue you're creating exactly. Um, and, you know, you know, if you just, you know, that would be one thing, but, um, you know, beyond that, you want to think longer term about how do you get the cells to do what you need them to do so that it isn't just a, you know, artificial device you have long term, but that it actually starts to reform um, tissue, which is the most relevant, not only mechanically, but also um, biologically. Great. Um, I guess because it's already five minutes past the time, um, we'll call it a day. And thank you so much, Nicole, for um uh for uh taking the time to give and um yeah um thank you so much and i guess uh have a great day and if the audience has any more questions feel free to email nicole or reach out to her on uh, linkedin thank you oh, thank you so much really appreciate thank it thanks Aaron. thanks hao Cheng. thank you to all the organizers thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. bye everyone bye